Welcome to Mercy Medical Center's live webinar. I am Lynn Dennis, Program Coordinator, and today's topic is coping with grief during the holidays. Joining us is Hospice of Mercy Director Tammy Buseman and Bereavement Coordinator Barbara Cook. After their discussion, they will take questions from our audience. If you are a regular attendee of Mercy's webinars, you will have noticed the format of our webinars has changed. The method to submit your questions has also changed slightly. Hover your mouse over the green bar at the top center of the screen and then click on the question icon, excuse me, question and answer icon at the far right of the strip. Then from the drop down box, select host and type in your question. Your questions will be confidential. Well, I'm very happy to welcome both of you to our webinar today, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Tammy so we can go ahead and get started. Lynn, thank you so much for this opportunity to share about grief and bereavement during the holiday season. Barbara and I are pleased to be able to be with everybody today. And mostly we want to attend to some, hopefully, what will be practical ideas, suggestions that you might find to be of assistance to you during this season. Uh, so you'll see in front of you our objectives for our time together today that we really want to help increase understanding of the grief experience that people go through to, as I said, come up with some ideas of maybe some specific strategies, things you might try and consider, and ways that you might help other people um, during this time as well and be a resource to them. And then we'll also share with you some additional resources that are out there on the World Wide Web. Thank you, Tammy. This is Barbara. And uh, up on the next slide here, let's see, this button right here? Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we thought we would take a few um, minutes in this time to just review a little bit about the grief process. And uh, I guess I, we call it the Grief 101. So we'll go through it rather quickly, but you can always refer back uh, if there's something that you missed. Um, this time of year, we look outside our window and we see the snow coming down, and uh, I'd like to have you consider, you know, um, how a snowflake, a snow, no two snowflakes are exactly alike, and that's a good way to think about our grief experience, that uh, the way I grieve, the way you grieve will be very different. There aren't very many rules in this uh, grief experience. Um, so as you see on the slide here, grief is a lot more than just the emotions, the feelings, and in fact, it's a really a mind, body, spirit, a, a holistic experience. And I like to emphasize that within the grief experience is a very wide range of what might be considered normal. So we'll go to our next slide here, and uh, I'll give it back to Tammy. So first and foremost, the thing that we often consider and think about as it relates to grief is uh, the various feelings that we find ourselves navigating from sadness to anger all the way down to bitterness and everything in between. And truth be told, any of these emotions can be in place at one moment in time and all of a sudden we find ourselves uh, washed over and overwhelmed by a very different feeling, and it is incredibly normal to have that range or not have all of them or certain parts of them. So um, what you'll hear us remind time and time again is there is no one right or wrong way to grieve and what to feel during this time. Tammy, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um that the whole thing about how you know our moods can change drastically um, as we're grieving, and uh, I, a lot of times, you know, people are told to, or they say it themselves, just trying to take things one day at a time. But I, I was uh, once corrected by a, a brief person who told me, you know, I just take it one hour at a time, and so that really uh, kind of indicates the variability. And uh, there, there's a name for those sudden. Uh, um, 
what shall we say, flood of emotions. Um, Alan Wolfelt calls them grief bursts, not outbursts, a grief burst. And a lot of times we know what triggers them, but more often than not, we don't know. So let's go to our next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit about how grief might impact our our cognitive abilities or the way we think. Um, I, um, probably right up there at the top of the list would be just this uh, inability to stay on task. Now, not everyone's going to have that, that difficulty, but certainly if you think about grief as being a very stressful time, we know that when we're under a lot of stress, it's, it's hard to keep our thoughts in, in order, and we maybe even have kind of a flight of ideas from one thing to another. Um, this has a lot of impact for bereaved people who are maybe having to return to the workplace after the death of a loved one, and they may find that their ability to concentrate and pay attention to their work might be somewhat um, diminished. Um, we see the word disbelief. Uh, I, I didn't. I um, very much on purpose did not put the word denial up there. Uh, denial uh, kind of has gotten a bad rap, and um, or, pe or you know people uh, get someone pointing their finger at them and saying, you are in denial. And I think it's what's really happening is sometimes a, a sense of disbelief that what has happened is really happening. And I'd like uh, just anyone to consider that when you've been given some tough news, maybe and of a sudden death or, or a, the, the tough news of a terminal diagnosis, and you might just find yourself saying, I can't believe this is really happening. And that that is part of our process of starting to um, fully take in the reality of the situation. So we kind of take, dose ourselves and we practice by saying, I can't believe this is really happening. But we'll move on now to our next slide. When we grieve, we expect to have these sad feelings that we talked about. We might not even be surprised by some of the changes in how we think, but we may not necessarily anticipate that there are times when our bodies will react. This is uh, something that affects our whole person. And so you see in front of you several different sensations physically that you might find yourself um, feeling, experiencing, and certainly they are normal and we want to make sure that in this process, in this journey, in this time, that we are taking care of ourselves and finding ways to make sure that we uh, are having the opportunity to get the rest we need while sleep changes may occur, that we are attending to our diets and getting out and exercising. Again, we may not always feel like doing those things, but it is important to maintain that self-care. Now we have some other um, common um, grief experiences, things that are well within the range of normal. Some people will experience this, others will not. Um, and you can read them there. The social withdrawal, I, I, I think that's um, uh, made evident when people say, you know, I, I just need to be by myself. I don't feel comfortable going out in crowds. I don't feel comfortable going into the church or with a large family gathering. Um, and, and some of that social withdrawal certainly um, is part of a kind of a, a self-care strategy that sort of built into us because we know that grieving is difficult work. It takes a lot of psychological, physical, emotional, spiritual energy. And that being on our own and withdrawing from the hubbub of the crowd can actually be very helpful um, as part of self-care. Um, so again, looking these over, everything very normal, very natural uh, in, a, in a grief experience. And so we shift gears and look at the spiritual component of how grief impacts us. And uh, as I'm looking at these um, items that are on here, 
I think the spiritual component tends to be one of those areas that we talk about even less perhaps than the other areas because it can tend to be so incredibly personal. And uh, depending on what sort of spiritual or religious background you might come from, there might be some accepted or expected ways that you are to handle or um, talk about or deal with, and I use that term lightly, but there can be expectations that people have for us to uh, just take it in stride, that it's just how things go. But that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what we think or feel. There tends to be some questions that come to mind where we're asking the why questions. We might start to look at the things that we've prioritized in our life and rethink that and, and think about what really is important, what really brings me meaning, and what do I want my life to be about from this point forward. And even thinking about what that legacy is that that person has handed on to you and how you might grab that torch, if you will, and continue that onward. There can be, for some people, uh, this sense of the deceased person being present with them as well. Again, one of those areas that mm, I don't know that we necessarily talk a lot about, but there there is reality to that. And uh, it's helpful to recognize that, again, you're not going crazy or imagining things, that this is part of the journey. Just to piggyback on that, um, that your last part there, Tammy, I know of a funeral director in town who very routinely will, um, when she meets with them after um, the funeral, she'll ask, well, have you heard from so-and-so or have you sensed their presence? So, and, it, and in that way, she normalizes that, that experience. So we've been talking about what grief might look like. Now we'll just gonna, we're going to say a few words about why the grief experience, it, 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 there's such variability. And so here we have the slide factors that shape your experience of grief. The manner of the death, that's pretty significant. Did death occur after a long spell of illness? Were, you know, was the family able to say their goodbyes? The patient able to wrap up unfinished business? Or was it a, a sudden, unexpected death? Uh, the relationship you had with the deceased certainly uh, will um, impact how we grieve. I like to give the example of the little boy whose grandma has died, and it's the grandma who lives three states away, and he loves grandma, but doesn't have the same relationship with her as he does with the in-town grandma who picked him up from school every day. So uh, that you can see how that would definitely have some impact. We should never assume that just because there's a blood relationship that there is great grief to be um, uh, endured. Um, your personal resiliency and a lot of the bereavement uh, research, Tammy, is, is centered around this whole concept of personal resiliency. There are just, I guess, some people where we see the glass half full or half empty. Um, our values and beliefs are, are, um, are, are very key. What, our, our beliefs about what happens after death can, can be very critical. Societal and cultural expectations, that, that speaks to a little bit about um, the availability of support and the community that we live in, of, of the, our family group, what is okay in our family in terms of uh, grieving and loss and, and what is not okay. We learn these things. The availability of support, I guess I already mentioned that. Um, and then finally, um, past experience with death loss. Not, And I've heard a lot of brief people tell me, they say, well, I've been through this before, so I know a little bit about what to expect. And yes, that's very, can be very helpful. But to, to remember, too, that, um, that just because you've been through it before, that doesn't, uh, um, deprive you from the, the experience of grieving or depriving you from the opportunity to grieve yet another loss. So we're going to, whoops, there, oh, foundational belief. Sorry about it. I got a little trigger happy there. Um, this is what we, we believe uh, at kind of our core beliefs about grief. First of all, uh, grief is not a problem to be cured or overcome. Grief is the natural um, consequence of a loss. 
and the loss we grieve today will likely stir up feelings from yesterday's losses. Um, that is so true, and when you think about how that could happen, um, let's say that you were only 15 years old when your first cousin died, um, and now you are 30 years old, and you've, you've lost a parent. And uh, when we, we have death loss, it's natural and normal to do a lot of life review and to remember those other losses. And so being 15 years old, you didn't have all the, the resources and support and maybe personal resiliency type uh, qualities to uh, to cope as effectively as you might about that cousin's death, and so now you are revisiting those losses today when you go when you're having a new loss. Uh, and then finally, this is so huge for us that we, it 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 goes to what we hope, what we have to hope uh, that within grief is the potential for growth, for healing, and wholeness that. Uh, you know, within these hard things, these hurdles in life, there are opportunities that of, of learning, of, of achieving greater wisdom. We may not always see that at the onset, and it would be a big mistake for me to, you know, rush to a newly bereaved person and say, oh, this is going to strengthen you in ways you can't believe or understand right now. <laughs> I think that would not be a very helpful thing to say, but more than likely the bereaved themselves will come to that conclusion. I appreciate you mentioning that, Barbara, because I think uh, for all of us, when we get in these uh, scenarios where we're talking to somebody who is grieving, who has lost, sometimes we lose track of ourselves and we're not sure what to say, so we fill in the space, um, oftentimes in, in not very helpful ways. And so again, as we continue forward and talking about some ideas here just shortly, uh, our hope is that uh, it can be really more about presence that we can provide to one another. And, and as we're thinking about the holidays, for some people, in truth, um, as they approach this period of time, they just wish that they could sleep their way through it and wake up and it's the new year and all of that would be in the past. Um, it's a common wish, actually, among those who are grieving and not just those who are newly uh, bereaved, but for those um, sometimes year after year as they approach this season. And the reason for that is because the holidays bring with them this intrinsic stress that comes, and particularly as it relates to the loss, holidays are intensely family-oriented, friends-oriented, time with coworkers, neighbors. There's built-in traditions that exist that call for us to be in community and be with people. And when we recognize that maybe that key person is not present with us, uh, there's tr certainly a tremendous sense of loss and change that we are experiencing. We may find ourselves um, to not have those key support persons to be as available to us because they too are finding themselves more busy than usual during this season. You know, you might not feel very thankful as one who has experienced loss. Um, maybe people don't want to admit that out loud, but that may very well be a feeling that you have. And then there can be this sense of feeling torn between the sadness that is very real and being experienced and this need to put on a good front for everybody and have everything together uh, because maybe you feel uncomfortable or they might be feeling uncomfortable with uh, the loss that has been experienced. Kenneth Doka is um, a, a grief and loss expert, and he um, does a lot of work with uh, hospices um, here in this country. And, and he put together um, the three C's of coping with the holidays. And just as I read that out loud, I, I don't want to give the impression that this is some you know, easy, you know, one, two, three, magical recipe. I think he uses the three C's as a, as a way of maybe organizing some of uh, the ways that we would think about approaching the holidays when we're bereaved. So the first C stands for choose, you know, making those choices to carefully review all those activities and expectations uh, around our holiday um, rituals and gatherings 
and be intentional. I've, I've, um, through the years, you know, many people have have said things to me like, you know, I just don't even want to think about it, and uh, I haven't, I, I just can't go there right now, and, um, and what I offer as some, as some gentle encouragement to them is maybe just do a little bit of thinking, maybe have a, kind of a, a rough idea, uh, not that you have to uh, follow through with everything, but to spend a little time thinking about what would be most healing to you. The second C stands for communicate, and that means that you are more than likely discussing that with family members. And uh, I just had a conversation not too long ago with a, um, a widow, and, you know, she did make choices. She was intentional. She did discuss her choices with her family, but then they didn't like that, and she ended up having to do everything that she intended not to do. <laughs> so, you know, this isn't a perfect plan. Um, uh, and I and I guess her family didn't really hear her, or they heard her, but they didn't really comprehend what she was trying to, to get across. So as to the extent that you can, discuss, communicate. And, you know, as you are having this dialogue with other family members, perhaps you can then come to some form of compromise um, that maybe we can do this, but we have to do it a little bit differently this year, or maybe we'll do that, but we'll have a different location for it. So the three C's, to choose, to communicate, and to reach some compromise. And that leads us now into some of our uh, more practical suggestions, and we're drawing upon um, the um, the wisdom of uh, Dr. Alan Wolfelt, who is a, another well-known grief educator, uh, and uh, we utilize a lot of his materials in our hospice work. And he has a book uh, with uh, 100 practical ideas for getting through the holidays. And uh, don't worry, we're not going to go through all 100 of them, but we've picked out a few of our favorites that maybe um, – uh, could be most helpful. So we're going to start out, I guess Tammy's going to start with the first one. Yeah, so our first one is this idea of savoring the moment. What in the world does that mean? Well, when people think about the holiday season, it is this vast period of time that goes from Thanksgiving all the way to New Year's and can seem incredibly overwhelming for people, particularly when they're mourning. And uh, the truth of the matter really is, as Barbara and I visit with different people who've experienced death loss, um, oftentimes the anticipation is far worse than the actual day or event or experience that you are thinking about and planning for and anticipating. Really, what I encourage you to consider is making the most of the holiday season that really does have something unique to offer to those who are in mourning. For example, the holidays provide a change to the schedules that we often keep. They can get a little more hectic, but there is a lull that does uh, occur, and we need some downtime when we're mourning to be able to retreat and really fully experience our grief. There's also this need for the presence and support of other people, uh, those that we love, that we care about, who also love and care about us, and the holidays provide some natural opportunities to connect and be with those dear people. And finally, the holidays are always a key time to share memories and reflect on holidays in the past. And that can be a tremendously cathartic and very helpful thing for those who mourn to be able to tell the stories, to remember, to share um, funny memories, to also share lessons that may have been learned as well over the years. Keep what matters. Um, that goes back to um, this whole notion of choosing and, and being intentional, of to think think of what traditions, what rituals really mean the most to you. It may not mean having a four-course 
dinner, elaborate dinner with all the, the, the fancy foods that you normally prepare, maybe the most important thing is the family gather together. And food can be kind of secondary this year, so you can order out. Um, another example might be that uh, you, you look and, and decide, well, maybe the thing that's most important for this holiday is to be in community in community with your faith and, and your your support, your spiritual support, and let the other matters of the holidays fall aside. So think about keeping what matters the most. So along that frame of mind and reference, <clears throat> just to dig into that a little bit more, as we think about attending to our spirit, I came across a story recently of a woman whose husband died um, <clears throat> sometime in the last year or so, excuse me. And as she anticipated these holidays coming up, she started thinking about all the ways in which her husband just delighted in Christmas, decorating the house, um, doing all sorts of things around with them as a family, and then thinking about some of the um, – faith practices that they often had shared together. And one of the decisions that she made on her own was that she just didn't think that she had the energy to take on all the decorating, uh, participating in the worship experiences as Christmas approached. And so she just kind of decided she wasn't going to do that. And so the house stayed as it was, and she found that to be helpful for herself. But actually, on Christmas Eve, as she was expecting the children to start arriving, it dawned on her that uh, she also had the kids coming who needed some sense of normalcy, and they also were grieving. And so she had to think about not only herself and that, but what might be helpful for them and their spirits as well. And so she quickly did some decorating and, and prepped and... and um, and kind of pulled some things together. And, and so that's where she's sitting now, recognizing that she she will partic participate in some of what they've done before, but maybe a little differently, and uh, plans to have some dialogue with the kids about what might be helpful for her, why she's maybe not incorporating all the elements that they've always incorporated, uh, because that's what she's needing at this time. Tammy, your words reminded me of a story from my life, and, and that is um, the first Christmas after my brother's death. He died in early March, so what, what would that be, about nine months later. Christmas rolls around, and I did not really feel that I had any heart to to do decorating. And one of the most beautiful gifts that I received from my daughter, who would have been about, oh gosh, maybe about 16 years old at the time, she says, Mom... I'll decorate. And sure enough, she started dragging out the boxes and, and putting things up. And yes, she did it a little bit differently than, than the way I did. But um, what a beautiful gift it was. And I found, too, that just then seeing these decorations uh, kind of brought me into a little different uh, place emotionally and spiritually. So it was really helpful. So now I want to talk about, oh, receiving support from others. So I guess, <laughs> I guess that's an example of what I did rather than say, oh, no, no, you don't need to do that or, or, or beat myself up thinking, oh, I've got to do it. You know, I'm supposed to do it. That I was able to sit back and, and also to accept that maybe the way things were done were a little bit different, but it was still okay. Um, I, when we accept care and support from others, it's, we're not the only ones who benefit. We give those people a tremendous gift, and that is the gift of service and, and what it does for their hearts and spirits when their actions and words and care, you know, make a difference in the, in the lives of someone. So uh, it's really a two-way street to give someone the gift of, of allowing them to help you. So I think you've probably picked up from this point this idea of relationships, that really that is what this is all about, um, not just even the holiday season, but just we as people. We're wired for relationship. 
And uh, the invitation that the holidays offer to us and those who grieve and mourn is to think about what we care about, who we care about, what would be truly meaningful, to focus on what we need in this moment today, and also to think about this relationship with the person who who has died, that they do still that relationship still requires some attention on our part, uh, but it might mean creating a new relationship based on memories that we have instead of, of course, that person's physical presence with us, uh, but thinking about how we might relate not only differently with, with others around us, but, but even with this memory that we carry with us and treasure. And you gotta love these laughing children. <laughs> Maybe we'll we'll be talking a little bit more about children, but uh, uh, the next uh, idea or strategy is to ask for the gift of memory. And I have a story to share about that. A number of years ago, I uh, a widow uh, shared with me that uh, um, her husband had died in November, and so um, they were working on you know, during the, in later November, sending out their thank you and notes to the people who had, had supported them. And, and inside those notes, they, uh, she put a little message and she said, one of the greatest gifts that you could give our family at Christmas is the gift of a memory. And I think she might have even enclosed a little three by five card and, um, with her address, you know, and so, so December came, the holidays came, and in the mail almost every day came a memory, a gift of a memory. And so she was uh, pretty intentional, you know, about asking for that, and she gave a gift to those people, a way that they could could help her. And I think just the whole idea of, you know, that comes this time of year and we know someone's newly bereaved and you ask yourself, well, do I send a holiday card? You know, will that, you know, bother them? Um, because maybe they won't be all Merry Christmas, but um, this bereaved person, this widow, found a way uh, to kind of bridge that difficulty, that awkwardness after the gift of memory. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that as we go through other slides and laugh. Um, oh, I think you're supposed to be talking about la I better give this back to you, Tammy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm glad this one is mine. Um, I have to tell you, the timing of it is is really serendipitous, I think, um, for myself and for my family as well. Um, actually, yesterday, we just experienced the loss of one of my grandmothers who died suddenly. And uh, laughter is a big part of the Boozman family. It is who we are. It's a big part of how we interact and spend time together. And, um, you know, so when I think about the holidays, I think of uh, joy and laughter that occurs. Uh, in truth, I also think about times when, for some people, they don't feel much like laughing, and that's, that's really okay, too. But for my family this year, I can tell you that we are holding on tightly to this wonderful gift that we were given yesterday in my grandmother's passing. Uh, she su suffered from uh, dementia for several years now. And um, yesterday early morning, right around 4.30, she um, w was in her room at the care center and the nurse came in to check on her. And grandma was in there, um, I guess, talking, which she hasn't done for a long time, and laughing and giggling and was just as delighted as can be. And right around 5 o'clock, they went back in to check on her, and she had slipped away. And I will tell you that um, myself and the rest of the Boozman clan will not only hold on to that memory and that wonderful gift, but there will be laughter as um, as we gather this weekend, but also as we gather again at Christmas because um, it is just part of us and how we interact. And there is something truly healing that, that occurs um, not only mentally and emotionally, but physically, uh, there's something that happens to us as we laugh. There's a hope that can be restored as well amidst the pain that we feel. When we laugh, especially those belly laughs, we are getting lots, lots of oxygen into our lungs and it goes up to our brain and promotes our well-being. So lots of good reasons 
to engage in laughter and to let it to, to give yourself permission to laugh. Fill the empty chair. For so many of us, um, we have designated spots at the table. For instance, when I sit down in my holiday table, I know exactly where I'm sitting. It has to be close to the kitchen, don't you know, because I have to get up and get things. <laughs> but uh, so, so let's imagine a situation now where there is that empty chair. And um, one, one uh, way of thinking about that is making that a chair of honor. And maybe that chair that was usually occupied by your deceased loved one now is occupied by perhaps the youngest or the next oldest member of the family. Um, so you would fill it. Uh, other families have decided to leave that chair empty and to go ahead and even make a place setting kind of as that uh, symbolic representation that even though physically the loved one isn't there in spirit, they are still a part of that family. Um, lighting a candle, and let's see, I should maybe go forward to some slides here. Um, well, I think Tammy was going to talk about, but since it, since I've got the microphone on, I think I'll go ahead. Carry on. This time of year, uh, it's all about candles, isn't it? That we light a lot of candles in our homes. It's kind of part of our our tradition. And here's some some different ways to think about it. At this, uh, you see a. Um, uh, a picture here of all these different candles, and here's here's what happened. Uh, all the family members uh, were invited to bring a candle of their choice, whatever color, shape, or size, to bring that candle to the the holiday gathering. It was then incorporated into kind of this this setting. This became the centerpiece on the table. And as the candles were lit one by one, the person who brought the candle would light it and then share a memory. And so everyone went around the table lighting the candle and sharing a memory. So not only did they have this beautiful, kind of a colorful centerpiece, it became kind of the focal, the focal point of their, their memories of the deceased loved one. Uh, a lot of people find it helpful, and I'm gonna flip ahead here. Um, this is kind of a memory um, escape. Um, this is my dad, uh, who's been gone now for um, about seven Christmases. And I create this as kind of a focal point in my my home. I light a candle. Um, I uh, He was an engineer, thus the slide rule. For younger people looking at the webinar, that thing in the foreground is called a slide rule. And it, it's used to make calculations. My dad was a musician. Well, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but um, this is a, kind of an outward um, um, showing or an outward way of, of saying that anyone who comes into my home knows that my father's spirit and who he was as my dad is still a part of my life. And lighting that candle seems to bring that into to focus. Now I'm going to go back here and... I think, Tammy, it's time to let you talk a little bit. Well, maybe I'll just keep on. I'll just keep on going um, be, because, you know, creating this um, this um, vignette of, of objects and, and a photograph, um, that became part of my own um, ritual, my own grief ritual. And I can't tell you how many times we talk to people about uh, being intentional with their grief work. Um, when people come into my office and as they maybe tearfully, you know, the, the words spill out, the tears spill out, telling as they tell their story, and when they're done, I just gently ask, well, tell me when was the last time you you shared your story? And they look at me, they shake their heads, I haven't, not at all, you're the first one. And then that that uh, it provides a wonderful opening as a as a bereavement counselor to suggest that maybe they would like to create their own daily time of remembrance. Maybe it's in the morning when they just get up that that maybe they they create a display of their loved one's photograph, maybe another object, and and light that candle, and in those few moments to maybe read a, a meditation, a grief-related meditation, or a prayer, or just talk aloud to their, their loved one. 
And by doing that, that gives kind of that release. You know, when you keep all your your thoughts inside, you know, your, the teapot of your your body or the or the the cooker, um, when it when it starts to bubble over, it might explode or you might lose complete control. But if you you make it part of your daily ritual, that might be helpful. Or maybe a day's end would be a better time. Um, so let's move on here. Um, we've talked about going back here. We've talked about creating that memory display. And you can be very creative with it. Another um, strategy or an idea that we give bereaved people is to have them consider purchasing a beautiful greeting card. And um, if <laughs> I tell you, I've, I've uh, stood there in the Hallmark store or the card aisle of the grocery store, and uh, I'm looking over those cards, and I remember, again, going back to my, my brother's death those many years ago, the first big holiday that came up was Easter. And I stood in front of those Easter cards, and I saw those that, that said, like, to brother and his family at Easter time, and the tears just came. And I thought, you know, I'll never be able to buy one of those cards again. But as I thought about it and I did a little, you know, reading in, in you know, grief self-help books, there was that idea to go ahead and get that card. And, and so for a lot of people, you know, to purchase that card that maybe says, although we're not together at Christmas or, you know, mother, though we're separated or the miles apart, uh, sometimes those cards will say exactly all, you know, the sentiment, all the things that we want to say and to display that card prominently with that photograph, with that that candle, that might be a very meaningful uh, tribute symbolically, you know, letting everyone know that at this time of the holidays that you are remembering the one that, that you've lost. Um, Tammy, I've been talking too much. It's your turn. <laughs> so we have for you another suggestion of perhaps a ritual that you already participate in and, and maybe reframing that and utilizing it in a little bit different way. That being the Advent candles and Advent wreath that many folks have in their homes. Um, this uh, is a little reading that could be done, re, uh, again, reframing each of the candles to um, better fit sort of this, this time, this experience that we find ourselves in. This is titled Remembering Our Loved Ones. So you might use it as a reading that's shared. Um, you might do that individually or do that with um, friends or family members. Lighting that first candle, representing hope, our hope for healing and renewal following the death of our loved one. The second candle representing yearning for a sense of peace. The third candle representing our need to balance our sorrow with moments, no matter how brief, of joy. And that fourth final candle representing our love for our, that person who we have lost, as well as the love that we received from him or her along the way. So we continue on with some other specific thoughts, ideas that you might want to consider or, or suggest to share with others. This idea of preparing your loved one's favorite holiday foods. Foods are a big deal for people around the holidays. And uh, sometimes people uh, recognize that maybe they want to make some changes because what they've always done, they're maybe not interested in doing that anymore. I know of a, a gentleman who um, his wife had always had uh, everything just so for their meal. And he reclaimed that and has made it his own and, and trying something a little bit different as the entree each time and not just inviting family over, but doing several different meals and sessions with friends, um, card um, groups that he's a part of, whatever the case may be. Um, but there's others that I've known who, as a family, for example, who um, always got people together to make cookies and candies and make up just a ton 
ton of them so that they could put together little plates to give away to many, many different people. And, uh, and I recall one family talking about uh, that first holiday when actually both of their parents were gone and having a, an honest conversation amongst themselves and saying, are we going to keep doing this? Are we not? And they actually chose to continue on. And it still is a an important day when they all gather together, roll up their sleeves, and each sort of has become a specialist with um, certain cookies or candies or treats that they've made together over the years. So it's it's a great way to carry things on. When a family gathers together for that holiday meal, um, they may be very well aware of, uh, you know, there's kind of this dark cloud over the gathering, and um, they, no one has yet spoken the deceased loved one's name. Maybe there's this little bit of awkwardness and tension and wondering, well, do we, what should we do? Is it, are we, is it okay for us to go ahead and, and, um, you know, go ahead with our, our holiday dinner. Um, and, and so here's the idea that uh, you offer a toast, and that might be kind of the icebreaker uh, of, of sorts, that uh, it, you offer a toast to the, the memory of your loved one. I've known some families where they will actually go ahead and pour, you know, whatever they're drinking, <laughs> the, the juice or the wine into the empty glass, uh, symbolically, you know, asking that loved one to be present with them. Uh, th there are a lot of options for toes. You can, it's a great time to interject a little bit of humor. Maybe you want to go around the table and everyone raises a glass uh, to offer a toast. And our last bit of suggestion has to do with the reality that the holidays will not go on forever. And it is good and important for us to think beyond that and to even plan for something special that we can look forward to that will come after the new year. Something that, um, you know, maybe is a bit of a reward for yourself in early or mid-January. And that's certainly a time we could all use a little reward sometimes. Um, so it, it's a bit of an age-old trick just to um, get ourselves focused on something out further down the road. Maybe it's a vacation. Maybe it's something really quite simple, going and, and getting a massage or purchasing a new book on your e-reader or a actual printed book that you can hold on to. Whatever would restore or renew you, that's what you want to be thinking about and planning for. So now we'd like to share with you um, an affirmation. Um, and you might like to uh, utilize these words to say them aloud to yourself in, in the coming days, make it part of your ritual. Um, so we'll begin it. As I embrace my grief, I can and will find that the pain softens. As I embrace my grief, I will listen to my head, I will listen to my heart, I will listen to my inner voice. As I embrace my grief, I once again will be able to enjoy life. As I embrace my grief, I will rediscover that I care for and about others. I didn't say that right. I will rediscover that I care for and about others. As I embrace my grief, I will laugh and smile again. My experience with grief is powerful. So is my ability to help myself heal. In doing the work of grieving, I am continuing toward a renewed sense of meaning and purpose in my life. And now we've just put up a few um, websites uh, for your reference if you'd like to dig in a little bit deeper with some of the things that we've talked about. Got quite a few options for you. Well, thank you both for sharing such good information, um, Tammy and Barbara, both of you. Uh, to remind our listeners, your questions can be submitted by hovering your mouse over the green bar at the top of your screen.
Okay. Uh, we have a, um, one comment from, from someone who is sharing that she has also found good information at um, www.thegrieftoolbox.com. I don't know if either of you are familiar with this one, but thank you for um, sharing. I think it's those grief um, books, the websites that you can learn so much um, by immersing yourself. Okay, and question. I have heard the phrase, fake it until you make it. Does, um, do you think this is a healthy attitude to take for a person who is grieving? Well, Lynn, I have heard that uh, uttered uh, before in, in, in a bereavement support group. And I think that what that is is kind of uh, maybe a mantra or it's, you know, uh, it might be like uh, this too shall pass or, you know, one day at a time. Fake it till you make it. Um, you hear a lot of bereaved people say, you know, I encounter people as I walk down the street. They say, how are you? And then I just say fine or I really don't feel fine, but I say that because I don't think they're interested in hearing how I really feel. So um, for um, a lot of people, that would make sense that sometimes just to, to get through, to whatever it takes to get through, to maybe put on that brave face, um, and you, you, you're in charge of that. You, you get the choice of, of who you share with and who you don't. Now. Uh, like most helping strategies, um, there comes a point maybe if you were always being um, a bit faky or uh, not honest about how you're really feeling, I'm wondering if there would come a point where that is not really working well for you. Um, so to the extent that you can find at least one or a couple people where you can be your authentic self, where you can tell it like it is, and uh, and and get real with people, but fake till you make it. It's a little bit of self-help, self-talk, I guess. Very good. And again, it's your choice to do what works best for you. Okay. A next question: Do you have any special suggestions for helping children grieve? I know you had the photos about laugh, and is there anything you would like to add um, as far as guidance for um, children who are going through the grieving process? Well, yes, we do, and I think sometimes those children in the family are kind of a barometer of how the family is doing overall. Um, as we grow older, as we become adults, we kind of uh, have all these barriers and we, we can stop our impulses and we become maybe a little more inhibited, but kids just let it out. We, so. Um, for children who are grieving, a lot of times I'm going to ask the parent, well, what types of things have you been doing maybe to to remember grandma or grandpa? Or um, when you see your child cry, what is your response? And, and sometimes we find that really um, the, the thought is, well, as long as if we don't talk about it or we don't think about it, the kids will be okay. But then the kids start displaying some of these more, you know, active grief responses, and that's our 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 key or our red flag that we maybe need to be delving into them and giving them opportunities, maybe involving the children in the ritual of remembrance. Now. I, I really think, too, that children can lead the way for us, and I've heard this time and time again from bereaved families. They'll say, you know, we were all sitting around there kind of tense and uncomfortable, and then our four-year-old said, oh, well, I just talked to Grandpa, and then she carries on, this, this long, tells his long story, and that kind of breaks the ice. And um, another way we can um, kind of get well, another thing that, that children teach us is the importance of play, the, the importance of activity. And so if you can pull out your crayons and your glue and your, your, um, your paper and involve the children maybe in making a card that remembers the loved one or creating this memory scape that, that we were referencing earlier, let the children lead the way and let the children express themselves in arts and crafts and through play. Very good suggestions, Barbara. Next question um, is coming from, I feel that grieving and starting to heal has pushed me towards some major life decisions. 
Is that normal? And should I question the decisions I'm making due to a charged emotional time? Boy, that's a very good question. Tammy, are you going to take this one? That definitely is a bit of a loaded question, but a very, very good question to be asking. Um, absolutely, there's a, a great sense of normalcy to um, those major life decisions that start to emerge because we do start to f ask some fundamental questions about our life purpose, what's important to us, what are what are our priorities in an ongoing way from this point forward. Now that all of a sudden life has thrown a curveball and has changed for us and what we thought was always going to be maybe has now changed. So um, certainly it, it, it makes sense that we are asking those questions. It is important, though, that we do continue to surround ourselves with those important people to us who can help be barometers so that um, if we just all of a sudden come up with that, something that's totally changing the landscape or make a decision that um, completely does a 180 in our life, uh, we do want to make sure that we have some sense of, okay, it, this is a long-term decision perhaps that is being made. Uh, what are the implications of that? And recognize that we will have a little bit different um, process in our thoughts and we might not be thinking quite as clearly. So uh, to me, it's a balance. Um, I definitely don't think we need to shy away from making big decisions or um, avoid choosing something different than we might have ever chosen before. I think that's okay and I think that's that's normal. But recognizing we do need to uh, have some wisdom around us too and people who can help keep us balanced when maybe we might not be completely able to do that ourselves. If you have questions after our the live um, segment of this uh, webinar is over, you could call um, Mercy of Hospice at 319-398-6735 or um, additional information at the website mercycare.org forward slash hospice. Our next webinar is Chronic Pain with Mercy Palliative Care Medical Director, Dr. Ken Serlock, and Joni Henderson, Nurse Practitioner. It will be broadcast Tuesday, January 14th from noon to 1, and they will take questions um, after their discussion also. Now, a tape of this program will be available at the address on your screen, mercycare.org forward slash live. And you can always check this website for information about future webinars and listen to past webinars. If you're interested in future Mercy webinars or other events, you may sign up for Mercy's electronic newsletter at mercycare.org forward slash enews. I believe we have covered all the questions that were submitted to us, but again, if you have additional questions, um, the telephone number 398-6735, um, Barbara or um, Tammy would be available. So thank you so much for joining us today.